derived from the Czechoslovakian word robota. Robota is uh, the Czech word for extremely hard labor, basically slave labor. The uh, primary characters in RUR were robot workers, were machines uh, made to work extremely hard. And the play involved uh, them being exploited mercilessly by the factory owners. And, and eventually they revolted <laughs> and uh, destroyed humanity. RUR did set a, a tone for how the West at least views robots. Then, in 1926, Fritz Lang's classic film Metropolis became an international hit, expressing similar themes to RUR. Metropolis was the 1926 masterpiece by Fritz Lang, which uh, took place in the year 2026, exactly 100 years uh, from when the film was actually made. And you had the uh, beautiful city, uh, all the beautiful people, the beautiful architecture and everything, but really underneath the city you had these oppressed workers who were really responsible for all this lavish lifestyle. To control the laborers, the city's leaders created a robot to infiltrate the workforce. They gave the machine life by transferring the soul and looks of the human character Maria. Once again, it was the evil mad scientist creating a renegade soulless robot built to enslave human beings. Metropolis became the prototype for sci-fi and horror films for the next 50 years. Well, if you look at Maria, who is really considered just the most beautiful of all robots and really one of the very few female robots ever in film, she was the inspiration for uh, C-3PO in the Star Wars series. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the shape of the head, all the piping and tubing around there, I think Lucas went to go for that classic design and also to pay tribute to Fritz Lang and Metropolis. Throughout the 1920s and 30s, science fiction literature became the rage and villainous mechanical men were a popular topic for the pulp magazines. The stories once again portrayed the creations as evil, power-hungry machines. But a new image for robots was about to emerge. Uh, are you married? Not yet. See. Well, would you like to be married? Yeah. You would. Well, now, turn your head to the left. Look at that young lady down there. Would you like to marry that young lady? She'll do. That it is entirely... Technologically advanced mechanical men became a popular attraction. Alpha was built for the British Exposition in 1930. The robot would amaze audiences with its array of tricks. By far the most advanced mechanical man was Electro, the hit of the 1939 New York World's Fair. All right, Electro. Will you tell your story, please? Who? Me? Yes, you. Okay, toots. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be very glad to tell my story. Westinghouse engineer J.M. Barnett designed the 260-pound machine to demonstrate the wonders of electrical control. Electro operated with 11 motors, 48 relays, and a series of photocells and electric eyes similar to the devices used to open doors automatically. However, the robot wasn't as smart as he appeared. The speaking was mostly performed by a man hidden behind the curtain. Quiet, please. I'm doing the talking. That's the most remarkable thing I've ever seen. And in the 1939 World's Fair, I personally saw Electro, and um, it was uh, an amazing experience because we didn't know what that robot was. We thought the robot could answer our question. I asked it a question about when will the oil reserves of the world give out, and it answered my question, and uh, it, was, it was very spectacular. In 1940, Electro was joined by his faithful dog, Sparko. 
and the machines continued to wow audiences. They were a lot of fun and they completely captured the imagination of, of everyone who saw them. You have to remember, we didn't have Star Wars and Star Trek and Forbidden Planet and all that back then in the 30s and 40s. I mean, people were just, wow. And I think it helped promote the image of science fiction and robots and uh, the future very effectively. The friendly demeanor of Electro and Sparco helped popularize a new positive vision of robots. Robots that remained under human control. This concept was cemented into our culture by the revolutionary writings of Isaac Asimov. I wrote a series of robot stories in which robots were looked upon purely mechanically and in which I had the uh, <laughs> I imagine novel notion that robots like other machines would be built with safeguards. I mean, nobody would, would manufacture a knife without a handle to hold it by. So I invented the three laws of robotics, which I always used in my robot stories. They are, one, a robot may not harm a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Two, a robot must obey orders given it by a human being except where that would conflict with the first law. Three, a robot must protect its own existence, except where that would conflict with the first and second laws. He decided that robots should be benevolent, not malevolent. And what he did with his stories, he put the robots into dilemma situations where it knew it couldn't let the person get hurt, and it knew that it couldn't let this guy say to hurt him, and, and the dilemmas were resolved always with the robot always being uh, subservient to man. Asimov's machines spawned new robots in science fiction writing and films of the early 1950s. Welcome to Altair 4, gentlemen. Uh, this is uh, no offense, but you are a robot, aren't you? That is correct, sir. For your convenience, I am monitored to respond to the name Robbie. You could really see the three laws of robotics demonstrated in Forbidden Planet. And there's this one scene in particular where Morbius tells Robbie to fire a weapon at the commander. Fire. And Robbie just freezes, and, you know, and, and he has this complete meltdown. You see? He's helpless. Locked in a sub-electronic dilemma between my direct orders and his basic inhibitions against harming rational beings. Cancelled. Forbidden Planet made Robbie the Robot a movie star, and he influenced a generation of future robot makers, even though he was really only a prop built for the film. Robbie is just absolutely revolutionary in his design. First of all, he cost the MGM prop shop over $125,000 back in 1955 when they were first putting it back together, which is just an, a, unheard of. It's like spending a million dollars on a prop today. You just don't see that kind of care and design. Functionally, Robbie has all these gadgets in his head, and like, what are those things? Well, you know, why are they there? But, you know, you have that vertical and horizontal scanner. That's so he can look around. I mean, all these things were based in science. He had those gyroscopes, those three spinning things at the top of his head to keep him balanced. He had these computer relays in his head. He would actually, you would hear Robbie think. Hey! Well, you low living contraption, I ought to take a can opener to you. Quiet, please. I am analyzing. Robbie was the first robot of the modern age to get people thinking that, well, maybe robots and artificial intelligence can happen, and it is in our future. And I think it got a lot of little impressionable kids thinking in that direction who are now, you know, designing the computers and making real robots. Asimov and Robbie inspired inventors who would soon merge fantasy and reality to create more than elaborate automatons they would build the first real working robots. Robots will return in a moment here on the History Channel. Now that the money has the new advanced battery, it's a whole new ball game. You have to be prepared for just about anything. Take that right, boys. 
new Energizer Advanced Formula. No battery lasts longer. So close. Fast. The Remington Microscreen 3 gives you three things no other shaver can. Our most powerful motor, 150 cutting edges, and three flexing microscreens. Guaranteed to get you smooth. The Remington Microscreen 3. Wonder why your throat is dry more and more. It's free sort. You gotta believe in the 